Hello, my name is Joseph Jones, and I'm the Senior Vice President at United States Drug Testing Laboratories in Des Plaines, Illinois. And welcome to my presentation on the future of hair testing fingernails. The educational objectives today are a brief history of hair testing. We will discuss the limitations of hair testing, some advantages of nail testing, the anatomy of nail and nail formation, how drug and drug metabolites are incorporated into nail, comparison of hair and nail results, and then lastly, some case studies. So the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, you guys know this better than anyone else, illicit drug use has been up, going up. Uh, this this data is a couple of years old, but we all know the trend and where it's going. And I was glad to see Dr. Uh, Teitelbaum also refer to Baldessari's paper in 07. Approximately 10 to 15 percent of healthcare professionals have some sort of an issue during their career. The National Council of State Boards of Nursing note that it's the number one, uh, it's the frequent misconduct, the most frequent disciplinary action. So what those two pieces of data tell me is that people abuse drugs and healthcare professionals are people. And so they're prone to the same ills that everyone else, they're not exempt. The difference is, is that this is a population that is sophisticated, they're educated, they're knowledgeable, and you guys have to figure out how to help these people. And that's not easy. This is not workplace testing. This is not drug court down at the county courthouse. This is testing healthcare professionals. They are a sophisticated group, so we need the right tests. We need the right technology and technologies to accomplish our task. So we need the tool and the tool. We need as many tools in the tool belt as we can cram in our little tool belts. And you'll notice this little this little dot here, is there a shine? The little blue dot on the corner, that's telling you something's coming up. And so you'll see that a couple of times throughout my presentation. My IT manager said I should copyright that and sell them for 50 cents each, but we'll, I'll let you have them for free. Does this have a, a pointer? Oh, so we gotta make sure we get our tools in the tool belt. We just had our lunch here, ladies, and I need to make sure that we're uh, not having our glucose crash, and of course our guys need to pay attention too. And then Grandma and Grandpa, we got one for you too, all right? So now everybody's awake, and we're ready to go here. Here's the tools in our tool belt. And so the interview, the urine, on-site urine devices, hair, oral fluid, blood, and also nails. All of these specimen types are at your, uh, uh, at your disposal now. If we'd had this discussion 10 years ago, half of these things would not have been there. Um, the interview as a, as a lab rat, you know, when I hear uh, uh, people talking about questionnaires and surveys and calling them instruments, it kind of makes me giggle because I think of, you know, a box with lights and computers and all of that stuff. But, but these things are instruments and they're extremely useful and, 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 and they have to be used in conjunction with all of these other tests that are at our disposal. Uh, urine is obviously <clears throat> the, the king of drug testing. It's been around in its, uh, standard, in its current format for many, many decades. Many more people understand urine testing than they do other types of testing, and it's usually the most economical to make happen. Uh, On-site urine devices, I remember when these things first came out, they're a disaster. And uh, one of the things that we had to do, one of the popular adulterants back then was Mary Jane Superclean 13. If you guys remember that, it was just Dawn dishwashing detergent, right? Well, my job as the rookie supervisor on second shift was to go into the receiving area and find the ones suspected of this and shake them and see if there was a, uh, see if you could get the, uh, the phone to come up. Well, those silly on-site cups, when you do like that, you're spraying urine all over the whole lab. And so you make friends quick that way. But, you know, over the uh, couple of decades these things have been popular, there, there are several of them that work very well. Uh, key on FDA cleared. Uh, be aware that some of them are made in China and come through under the radar. But if you've, get, if you've got a good one, they, they, they work very well as an on-site screen. You have to have them confirmed, but as an on-site screen, you can get your answer right away. 
Hair has been around um, uh, uh, for a couple of decades. Oral fluid, when I first came to USDTO, oral fluid was the hot new thing going on in drug testing. Uh, Lab one down in Lenoxa had been doing cocaine and uh, uh, what, cottonine and, and maybe one or two other drugs for the life insurance industry. And that was a very good test to make sure that the, uh, that the life insurance sales guy was not taking, you know, dog spit and sending it in um, and, and signing up uh, uh, people with large life insurance programs. But the oral fluid has definitely got its place because oral fluid is a blood filtrate, which brings us down to the next one. Um, in the context that we are talking today with blood testing, we're usually talking of phosphatidyl ethanol, uh, where blood is more of a reservoir matrix than a dynamic matrix with the blood drugs. The blood drugs typically are very expensive to test for, and the detection window is not very useful. Um, nail testing has been around for a long time and uh, uh, testing nails for heavy metals using fingernail and post-mortem analysis it has been around for a long, long time. But as far as a strategy to include in that tool belt is something that is relatively new and not a lot of people are pushing that. Our organization has kind of taken it upon ourselves to include that and make that one more tool in the tool belt. So a quick look at the detection windows. Uh, of course, blood and oral fluid are down at one or two days. Um, these tests are very good for under the influence testing. Because, yes, ma'am? I'm sorry, what are the blood drugs? The blood drugs is just the standard drug profile, but testing blood instead of urine. So, so a seven panel, 10 panel, what have you, in blood. Uh, they're, very, they're usually very expensive. And uh, the reason most people don't use them. Um, but under the influence, if you've got the parent drug itself in your blood or the blood filtrate, the oral fluid, then that is an, a per se indication that the individual, not inebriated, but was at least under the influence. So that can be extremely helpful under certain circumstances. Urine, we all know and love what that is. Hair, we get like a three month window of detection for head hair. And then fingernails, you can go back up to approximately six months. It's gonna depend on a lot of factors but it's possible and it is available. So here we have the hair drug test. And you can see this is an early picture of, of how drugs are incorporated in the hair. And, uh, and you can see the little yellow specks in the artery in there uh, going into the capillary to the root. And then you see the little yellow things um, only on the inside of the hair. You know, now early on there was discussion about um, uh, environmental exposure and how it's incorporated and how you can wash it off, etc. And so this was an early picture of what was going on with hair testing. But the advantages of hair testing, obviously it's simple, rapid, and non-invasive collection. Uh, but having a discussion at lunch today, I think someone may argue with me on that. Um, long window of detection, up to 90 days for head hair, body hair perhaps up to a year, depending on the person, depending on the hair. Uh, low dollars per day. So, you know, people usually um, raise an eyebrow at the expense of a hair test, but if you back it off to how many urines you would have to do to accomplish the same detection window, it usually comes out to be a little discount. Easy to store and ship. Uh, you don't need refrigerators and freezers. They're stored at room temperature. Relatively simple to analyze. Now, whoever made this slide, it was not me. Um, I, I, I have to argue with that. But, but once you get the hair reduced to an extract, it does follow the exact same strategy that you see in any urine lab where you screen it with amino assay and confirm it with mass spec. So that is extremely familiar. If you looked at one of our litigation packages, if you took out the first few pages, you could confuse it with a urine package. They look very similar. And no known risk infection. And so number four and number six combined means that you can put these things into U.S. mail. Now, you don't have tracking, but you could put it in U.S. mail, and it's perfectly legal to send that sample to the lab that way. Now, uh, in the laboratory, if none of you have had the opportunity to kind of see how this is done, you know, you think you take the hair, you put it in the tube, you put it on an instrument, and something happens, and the result comes out. And we can kind of picture that with a urine sample. You pour it in and something sucks up some pee and squirts it somewhere and you get a result and off you go. 
So with hair testing, obviously we have to prepare it. But first we have to receive it into the laboratory. And obviously that's not a hair specimen, but it's the same principle. Uh, we scan the paperwork and we scan the specimen. And the point that I want everybody to bring home from this is that when you collect that specimen and you apply that peel and stick barcode from your requisition form, whether it's one of ours or one of Tony's or one of CRL's or anybody's, that is such an important step because that is the, if you're using a barcode tamper evidence seal like we do, that is the primary forensic connection between that paperwork and that sample. And that's very, very important. And then ours serves double duty in that the, the, um, the seal is tamper evident. If someone tries to tear it off or break it, it's obvious when it gets to the lab, we know it's been tampered with. So super, super important to remember that over the top, make sure that it's either over the cup if you're doing urine or if it's the envelope with the hair that it goes around such that the flap can't be opened up uh, without, tamper, without breaking that seal. It's a very important step there. Now here's a lock of hair that has been weighed for screening. We, if the hair is longer than an inch and a half, we identify the root end and we cut it at an inch and a half. Inch and a half for most people uh, is approximately three months of hair growth. So that's the theoretical range of detection window. At an inch and a half, most hair weighs about a half a milligram. So to make this first test happen with 20 milligrams of hair, we need about 40 strands. And so that's the 20 milligrams they weigh out for the initial screening test. And then if it's, if it's negative, we're done, we don't need any more. But if it is presumptive positive, we need another lock just like that to confirm each confirmation. So if they're positive for four drugs, I need four more of these. Okay, so that kind of gives you a frame of reference of how much hair we need. Now once they weigh the hair, it's placed into one of these small vials. It's a two milliliter polypropylene vial. And here is when we do our washing step. We add uh, organic solvent. I will tell you, but I got some competitors here and I'm gonna tell you what we wash it with. <laughs> but it's washed and then they're allowed to uh, uh, dry after washing because it's organic, it evaporates. And, um, and then we place these ball bearings in there and here's the little ball bearings. These are two millimeter stainless steel ball bearings. And we put those in each tube, five to seven of them. And then that is placed into a tissue homogenizer. Now this device is called a mini ball mill. And you can see where the little tubes fit in there, eight at the time, we have a bigger one that has 16 slots. But that's a piston, and that piston moves in and out very fast. And after three to seven minutes of that activity of the ball bearings against the hair, it reduces the hair to a powder. Now this is very important because the next step, we add a mill of methanol. Write that down. <laughs> a mill of methanol. And um, the powder size of two to three microns is important because you want the it's all about diffusional distances. And so you want the powder particle to be small enough that the methanol can penetrate through all the little particles and extract out any drug back into the methanol. And that's the way that works. And we aid that uh, by adding sonic energy. This is the same type of device. It's a little larger, a little more heavy duty. Uh, the way when you get your jewelry cleaned at the jewelers, that's a sonicator, sonic bath. And so that's emitting sonic energy into that water, which imparts sonic energy to the particles and the methanol, and that helps aid extract the drug into the methanol. So after two hours, of, and that water bath is, is held at a warm temperature. So after two hours of this, the drug that's in that powder has been extracted into the methanol. We can centrifuge it, make a, a pellet, and then we're ready for uh, initial testing. Now, uh, for most hair tests, and for some urine tests, some of the oddball urine tests, you'll use a technique called ELISA, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, okay? Now that is a type of heterogeneous immunoassay as opposed to a homeogeneous immunoassay. What's the difference? So when we're doing urine 
and stuff with a high cutoff, we can use a homogeneous immunoassay, which means I can stick my urine sample on an instrument, a little probe comes in, sucks out some pee, and squirts it in a little curvette. It sucks out a little bit of reagent one, sucks out a re reagent two, everything's in liquid form. You have binding of drug to antibody, you can track the reaction, you get a, a result 20 minutes later and then one a minute thereafter. So that's homogeneous, everything is in solution. Well, for us, the cutoffs for hair are so much lower than what you do, you have to do uh, uh, this heterogeneous. So instead of the antibody being in solution, it's bound to the bottom of these little plastic wells here, okay? And when you put a little squirt of the sample in there, you let it incubate for a while, and any drug there will bind to the, um, to the antibody. And, and this is the important thing. Now you can go wash it and get all of that junk out of there. So now it's nice and clean. Then you add a squirt of reagent one, and all of the antibody that is not covered by the drug, antibody uh, reagent one sticks to it. Then you wash that out, you put in reagent two, that binds to reagent one, so now you've built this little sandwich. And that little sandwich ends up being yellow. And we use this robot here, this is an eight tip robot um, called a TCAN Evo 8. And it's super fast, but it can pipe at eight microliters, 10 microliters with CVs of less than one or 2%. So totally outperforms anything a human can do. A human could do these too, but there, you cannot achieve the same CVs that, that a, a, an instrument like this can. But at the end of the day, you end up with your plate here, okay? Now this was a batch of opiates, and you see it says OP on the side. And you can't really tell the difference in the yellows in some of them, but if you look at the first three in the top, uh, A1, B1, C1, if you'll notice, they all have about the same intensity of yellow, and the D1 is a little lighter, okay? That's my three calibrators, and that's my positive control. And then E is a negative, and then you'll see the ones that are clear. Now, the ones at the end here were just empty. Nothing was there. But the other ones, you can see where they were clear, and those are positives, okay? That means that the drug covered all the antibody, so we couldn't make... The, the sandwich. The ones that are dark yellow, there was no drug, so reagent one covered all the antibody, reagent two covered all them. We made a lot of sandwiches, so you've got a deep yellow color. So this is how the screening is done, okay? Now if it's all negative, we do one of these plates for each drug class, and if it's all negative, we're good to go. The results are issued out. If they're presumptive, then we go back and prepare the sample as we did before, but we go into uh, LCMS-MS, GCGCMS, or just GCMS, depending on the drug class. And that discussion is, is, is a little beyond the scope of our talk today, so we'll, we'll bypass that to maybe a, another time. But how do drugs get in the air? There are three main routes of incorporation. First and foremost is environmental exposure, smoke, transference, contact, and fumes. Once the drug gets on the hair, it will work its way into the nooks, crannies, and pores, bind to the proteins and pigments, is available, available to be harvested and analyzed immediately. Route two is the sweat and the oil from the scalp. Those fluids contain drug and drug metabolite. And as those fluids bathe the hair shaft, they deposit the drug and drug metabolite onto the hair. And you start seeing that show up a few hours after a dose, maybe not above the cutoff, but you can start seeing it if you're looking low enough. And then route number three, and what most people think about is the blood. It contains drug and drug metabolite, and it goes through the root, deposits into the root, and then as that portion of hair emerges past the scalp line, which is about two weeks, then it's available to be harvested and analyzed. So at the end of the day, we've got three extremely different modes of incorporation superimposed on top of each other. It's a very complex picture. So just based on that, you, you guys have heard me say a million times, if you call me, anytime you're testing a reservoir matrix, you can't backtrack, determine time, doses, or frequency because there's too many variables. And I, I try to say that as fast as I can sometimes. But. but hair, just like any other test, has limitations. Um, I get the question, well, what's the best test? Well, it depends on your circumstance. 
And so there's a test that might be better for your circumstance, which is why you need all the tools in the tool belt. But here's going to be a, a fun look at some hair. And this is some old data. These are old papers I'm pulling back that I'm pulling together uh, for us today. But we got uh, a bleaching, perming, dyeing chemical reaction. Oh, no, that doesn't cause a problem, not a problem at all, except that it does work. Uh, I've just had too many incidences where you've got someone positive, they come back with a bleach blonde job, and now they're negative. Congratulations. Um, and there was a paper back in 2001, what, this is 15 years ago. Uh, Dr. Tanaka uh, uh, showed us that uh, if you expose methamp to a variety of different um, um, uh, hair dyes, not just bleach, but dyes, that you will generate a, 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 a list of hydroxy products, which means they don't interact with the antibodies, which means they don't show up in mass spec. So you've effectively defeated the test. Does it go to zero? Maybe, maybe not. But maybe it's enough to knock you down below the cutoff. And so we have to be aware of this. It's real. Now, when I was at the Society of Hair Testing in Toronto, I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Pritchett. She was presenting some of her early um, studies about the use of the uh, hair relaxers. And uh, we uh, recruited her to write a, a, a little newsletter article for us, uh, for our little newsletter. And she eventually published a paper uh, last year in the Journal of Analytical Toxicology. And I think what she showed exactly shows what we've been saying for 15 years. The chemical relaxer, look at the effect it had. Now, I didn't realize there was two different styles of, of hair relaxer, but apparently there's one with line, one without. But look at the dramatic effect. Look at the cocaine, 6,000 down to 900, 6,000 down to 400. So, I mean, that's dramatic. So did it go to zero? No. But what if she just started out at 2,000? Or he? It had been negative. It does work. Now, these are fortified samples. Uh, if I remember correctly, these were uh, proficiency samples sent out by NIST that she was working with. But when she looked at an authentic user, she got an even more dramatic effect here, in my opinion. And so bleaching, perming, dyeing, chemical straightening. So this is saying it again. Now, as with anything else, it's always more complicated than just yes or no. Once you chemically treat your hair, you open the pores up so you can load more drug in. That's the catch-22. But then it kind of washes out a little easier, too. So you catch them before they bathe, after they bathe, after they bleach their hair, before they use again. You've got all of those variables, so it gets really complicated. Now, here's another hair color. Uh, this is an old paper from 96. Very well done, in my opinion. You have three rats, black rat, white rat, brown rat. And they were given 40 milligrams per kilogram daily. Now, I'm not a physician, but isn't that a lot? Yeah? All right. So these rats are loaded, huh? So they did that for five days, and then I guess they sobered them up and got a hair sample off of them. And what a dramatic difference. The white rat's at 900. And what really surprises me is the difference between the brown rat and the black rat. I would have figured, I would have guessed that would be a lot closer. Now, again, this is old data. This is 1996. It's 20 years ago. But it was, it was very well done and is still referred to today. Now, here's one with PCP. Again, 12 milligrams per kilogram daily. But this one was with the same animal. So what they're looking at is is you have the same animal, same dose, same genetics, same metabolism, and all of that. They're just collecting hair from two different pieces of his body. And they did that for five days. And then after the rat broke the uh, cage and had a psychotic event, they collected hair from him. Look at the difference here. Isn't that astronomical? That's really eye-opening. And that's off the same animal. Pigmented hair versus non-pigmented hair. Guess what? A lot of my hair is not pigmented now. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> so now, okay, so that's all fun. We're talking about rats. So let's look at some human studies. And this paper here, this was a, a, where I got this data from. This was 
one of the more profound statements that year in hair testing, and it was three sentences buried in the discussion as an, oh, by the way, this is what we saw. And when you look at the numbers, it'll make your socks jump off. But here we got an individual with grizzled hair. So you got black and white hair mixed, kind of like the beard there. Uh, 10 milligrams daily for three days of zolpidum. And then they collected the hair and they separated out the gray hair from the black hair, okay? And when they tested those different samples, look at the difference there. That's an 80-fold difference in zolpidum in the white hair versus the black hair. That's incredible. So, um, and, and then here, this was a, a presentation at the Society of Hair Testing back when it was in Arlington Heights. Uh, a fellow named Rollins uh, 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 did this study with, with uh, uh, individuals three times daily for five days, uh, 30 milligram oral doses of codeine, okay? And they collected the hair at those uh, time periods in weeks and uh, analyzed the first inch and a half. And the C-max that he got on them, first he uh, separated them out by color, black, brown, dishwater blonde, and strawberry blonde, okay? And, and these are the concentrations that, it, that he reported, 1134, 250, 119, 66. So a big difference between the strawberry blonde and the person with black hair. And that was not African-American hair. That was not Asian hair. That was just Caucasians with black hair, okay? So big, big difference. And we're going to refer to this later. They also did a, a measurement of the melanin in the hair along with the uh, codeine. And if you look at the R squared here, that's the coefficient determination. Take the square root of that and you get the Pearson correlation. And that would be about 0.85. Now these are two completely different compounds they have nothing to do with each other, supposedly, with the Pearson correlation coefficient of 0 0.85. 0 0.5 would be a strong correlation. This is 0 0.85. It's ridiculously connected. So hair color is a dramatic influence on the basis as far as how much we find in hair. Now, on the other hand, we have carboxy THC. And they looked at, let's see how many. 3,600 and some odd hair samples. And they divided them out by the color, and this was retrospective. Divided them out by color and got the mean carboxy THC, standard deviation, and did an ANOVA. And I, I like this because the stats are pretty cool when you think about it. So when you're looking at the analysis of variance, you're looking at the, uh, the differences in these categories, and you have an F value of 1.14, which is unremarkable, but the P value is 0 0.332. So obviously it's uh, statistically non-significant. 30% of those changes in numbers is pure chance, so nothing. And then we've got the eta squared. And the eta squared, who knows what the eta squared is, partial eta squared. That is the effect size. And so the effect size, a 10% effect size would be a small or weak effect. And so this is a 0.2%, so pretty much no effect at all. So carboxy THC is completely unaffected by, by hair color, and this, this clearly demonstrates this statistically. And then, of course, we've got other limitations. And there's that little blue dot again. So now we're going to go into fingernail. So fingernail, as far as I'm concerned, is just another keratinized protein. Hoof and horn. Antlers, bone, so that doesn't count. So hoof and horn, hair and fingernail, keratinized protein. Same stuff. And a little brief of the anatomy that we're concerned with, you have a nail matrix. That's where the nail originates. You have the nail bed, which is under the nail plate. And both are uh, uh, rich in capillary blood flow. Uh -oh. Now, I was providing testimony early last year. And unfortunately, one of my colleagues perjured himself. 
in a court hearing because he testified, and I'm going to say he, but it could have been a she. He testified that a nail clipping represents two weeks of drug use six months ago. And I said, no, Your Honor, that's not true. Um, and the other side adamantly insisted that, that, that he was right and I was wrong. And so I provided the court with a couple of pieces of information, and I don't know how that all came out. But I want to show you what I've been looking at, and then we can all decide together exactly what a fingernail clipping represents when you find drug in that fingernail clipping. So here is a group out of Italy, a well-respected group in, in, uh, in hair testing, and they've done a few nail papers. Uh, one of them is a founding member of the Society of Hair Testing. But they quote, this is a quote from this paper, nails grow according to two different directions, length and thickness. And I think that all of you guys probably know this already. Specifically in length, the fingernails grow approximately 0.1 millimeters per day. Toenails approximately 0.03 millimeters per day. You probably already know this too. But in thickness, you have formation of ventral layers by the nail bed. What does this mean? As the nail grows out towards the quick, not only does it grow in length, but it grows in thickness as material is being laid down underneath by the nail bed. Okay? And that thickening rate, they've even measured that, 0.027 millimeters of thickness for every millimeter of length. So clearly you're adding material underneath the nail as it grows out from that blood flow in the capillary and there's drugs in the blood flow. All right? So they estimated, this is Johnson and Schuster, 1993. 1993, this is old information. 20% of the total mass of a nail clipping is explained by thickening. Okay? If that's not good enough, let's look at some more data. Lamisil, you guys have all heard of Lamisil. You've probably seen the little commercials on TV. Antifungal, take it by mouth. At least that was what this study was done in 1990. Again, a long time ago, 1990. <clears throat> so they took this drug for 28 days and they started testing uh, plasma, but fingernail clippings to see what they found. And here's the evidence. So the nails on day seven, you start seeing this drug show up in the fingernail clippings. So how can that be if you have to wait six months before it moves out to the edge of the finger? It's not. That's the being added from the blood, from the capillary, and then as it starts to move out past the um, nail quick, it's available to be clipped and analyzed. So there's the evidence, and you can decide from the evidence if you choose not to believe it. That's, these are the scientific journal articles. I can't make this up. <clears throat> so a nail clipping, if you hear me interpret one, is representative of the entire time uh, from uh, approximately six months ago up until about a week ago, okay? Because it does have to emerge past quick to clip it. There's some other issues with, uh, with the influence, the, the, the growth rate, and some of these I was not aware of until I was pulling together uh, this uh, I didn't know pregnancy had a big deal with fingernail growth rate. Of course, I've never been pregnant, so I wouldn't know. Um, and, of course, you've got some drugs here at the bottom that uh, either interfere with or accentuate um, nail growth. So when we're doing our interpretations, we have to keep this in mind. Now, one of the biggest misconceptions with nail testing is you can't apply the same cutoffs. And that's because when most people are making that argument, they're thinking about this paper, which was published by a well-respected NIDA researcher down at Research Triangle Institute, Rapera Miller and her whole crew down there. But they were looking at eight healthy African-American men. Yeah, all males. Ten-week study, three washout. Cocaine, codeine, alternating days for six days. Okay? And they tested the hair, they tested the nail, they tested a bunch of other stuff. But this is the portion that we're looking at. 
And when you look at the, uh, the cocaine values, and when you look at the, uh, the, uh, the maximum concentration from the hair versus the maximum concentration from the nail, those are dramatic differences. And just looking at this, you're saying, oh, my God, fingernail is no good. We can't use that. You need to have different cutoffs, and I get that. So you're looking at, you know, 10 to 25 percent nail concentration versus hair concentration. That's a dramatic difference. But keep in mind that African-American hair or African phenotype hair is an ideal specimen type to capture a base drug like uh, an opiate or cocaine. It's ideal. And so with the codeine, we see something uh, even more dramatic because everything's less than 10% when you compare the hair to the nail. I mean, the nail to the hair. So big concentration differences. And this is what the, the, the people see that discuss nail testing, and this is what confuses them. This was a curveball. It's not their fault. So just to make it easy to look at, these are the means. So you had a 6,100 cocaine, a 850 as means, mean of 14%, uh, codeine 3,000, codeine of 180 with a mean of 6%. So dramatic differences in the concentration even when you look at the means. And again, there's that blue dot, so y'all look out. Remember this picture. Okay. Those are the concentrations that we found with the codeine in a similar dosing study. So 1,100 for the black hair, 250 for the brown hair, 119 for the dishwater blonde, 66 for the strawberry blonde, 180. So what nail testing does, and this is the one takeaway point that I want everybody to remember here today. This is it, okay? Is that nail testing normalizes for hair color. The biggest variable in hair testing is the pigment. There is a lack of pigment in fingernail. Therefore, the blondes, the reds, the browns, the blacks, all of those hairs are normalized by doing fingernail testing. It normalizes the entire population. And I think that's, that's a pretty cool little demonstration of that by pulling data from two different papers from two different periods of time. Same thing with the cocaine. We're looking at two other studies with similar dosing but not the same. And we get to 3,000 for the African-American hair, but 850 on the nail. And so the 850 would be similar to the brown or the dishwater blonde hair. Again, normalizing for the hair color. Now, when we compare hair to nail, now we've done uh, for several years now about 3,000 hairs a month. Of those are about 500 nails, and we've had the opportunity to have 91 matched pairs over the past year. Of these 91 matched pairs, we had 17 head hair fingernail positive methamp users. Okay? So we can directly compare what they look like in the hair and the nail. And this is what we see. So I would have assumed that just from the hair color that the, the hair would have been higher, but it's not. The nail actually is higher. Comp uh, if you looked at the previous data. Now what we don't know is how much of the amp hair has been diminished because of cosmetic treatment. That's a variable that we don't know. Could be. I had uh, some Adderall users, and these were hair and nail samples that were positive for AMP only, meth AMP negative, and the AMP was about the same levels for the hair and the fingernails, but the difference was is that nails picked up six additional users out of my little group. And then we did a study with oxycodone. We had a, a, a gentleman with uh, arthritis issues and was on a low dose of oxycodone, uh, five milligrams per day. I think that's a low dose, don't y'all laugh? But uh, he was taking that once a day, and um, he was able to see over a 18-month period of time, the five milligrams was like 20, 30, 50, and then it went 80, 75, 77. So after about six months, it plateaued and stayed there for about six or eight months before we ended the study. And then this is, the, um, this is a comparison of our database 
of uh, oxycodone hair and nail. And you see there's a strong correlation between the levels. And the oxycodone was about the same levels between the hair and the nail. So we go into marijuana, the acid of the group. These were remnants from a large study uh, that we were able to uh, find 22 matched pairs. And these are the levels that we found. Uh, 844 uh, um, uh, filtograms per milligram versus 4662. Um, and so the nail was much higher than the hair, which probably goes into the fact that the nail is much thicker than the hair and therefore does not wash out as easy. There's nothing really holding that marijuana in the hair. Oh, here's the low-dose oxycodone. Great. So here we go. BMI, 35 milligrams, followed nail for 18 months. And here we can see it plateauing out 80, 66, 66. That's 5 milligrams per day. So you get somebody in your program at 4,600 oxycodone. I had two pills last November. What's the answer? No, I don't think so. Now, this was a really cool study that I, that I came across not too long ago. And this was what really got me very converted to nail testing. Nail levels is a predictor of health. You're saying, but Joe, haven't you told me that any time you're testing a reservoir matrix, you cannot backtrack to determine time doses frequency? Y'all got that, right? Mm -hmm. Pray tell, Joe, why are you saying now that we can predict health off of a toenail? This is, a, this is a very early look into this, but this is really, really neat. And when I read this paper, I, I have to, as a lab nerd, I sort of jumped out of my skin when I got to the uh, conclusion on this paper. But here at the UC San Diego, so, you know, good group. Uh, uh, this was the health professional follow-up study. 210 uh, lung cancer, 630 controls, toenails tested. Back in 87, and they held on to these things for 12 years as they followed up on these people and published this in 2011. So I, I guess they had some grad student that needed something to do. Published this. <laughs> so here's what they found. The mean nic uh, uh you know, I, I made a mistake there. That's cottonine levels, not nicotine. Nicotine metabolite, cottonine. 950 picograms versus 250 for the controls. One of the limitations of their study was that they were not able to adequately control for secondhand exposure. And so we know that, that you can find secondhand exposure in your urine from, from nicotine because the levels are so much higher than the other stuff, and it's usually more consistent. And the p-value for that was, was very significant at 0 .001, less than. But even more importantly, when they took those cottonine levels from the toenail, this was the big toenail, all right? They took those levels and they distributed them in the, in the quintiles and they uh, did a relative risk analysis. They found a trend. And the p-value for that trend was extremely significant. Now I'm looking at that going, hey, wait a minute. So you're able to take a toenail result and predict the health outcome 12 years later. That's fantastic. We need to know more about this. And in their conclusion, they say, you can read it as well as I, we found that levels of nicotine, uh, and again, well, they did say nicotine, and toenail samples from our study population independently predicted lung cancer risk. I'm thinking to myself, what does ETG in toenail mean? Is there a predictor in the way you have to go about treatment? I don't know these things. I'm a lab rat. I'm just putting the question out there. But I think this is a fascinating area of study that needs to be fully explored. They also demonstrated a very similar observation with heart disease and, and toenail clippings. So this is, this is something I'm going to be watching for this group to see what else they come out with because this, to me this, is, this, this changes the whole ball game with, with nail testing. And maybe one day we can predict more accurately the behavior based on the toenail result or fingernail result. And uh, oh, here's that blue dot. Except this time it means that if you're debating on whether or not to go to the restroom, it's almost over. <laughs> it's been a long afternoon. Uh, you guys know this better than I do. Alcohol is a much bigger problem than drugs of abuse. 
And we had the honor of being funded by NIAAA to look at 529 matched hair nail samples out of a Midwest university. And this is what we found. We found uh, on average 30 picograms in the hair, 75 in the nail. Um, and these were matched pairs. Uh, large range of behaviors, everything from a couple of drinks all the way up to one kid was having 20 drink binges. It was amazing. Um, but more importantly, in a much, well, here, Society of Hair Testing has their recommended levels. They say that anything less than a 7 or 8 is consistent with abstinence. Anything greater than a 30 is consistent with excessive drinking. And then you've got the increasing risk as you go in between. So this has kind of been around for 7 or 8 years. People are accustomed to kind of using these numbers. But Dr. Lisa Berger took a much more detailed look at the data that we generated. And she was using their self-report data and their collateral data, which generated a whole other paper by Dr. Uh, Fendrich. But she looked at the different cutoffs versus a category of high risk, no risk, or, or an increasing risk. And if you were more than 30 drinks per week, she identified you as a high risk drinker. The sensitivity of the test at the three cutoffs was 100%. And obviously with the specificity, uh, they, they fell off a little. And in order to pick up any alcohol use, Obviously, the test fell down to 30, 37, 42 on the sensitivity, but the specificity was very high. So you're exchanging one for the other. And then when she looked at the increasing risk, risk drinking of greater than 15 drinks per week, we strike a happy medium there. So this was a very nice look at what does the nail ETG mean. She also did a ROC analysis, and this is what she found for hair and nail. So she found any drinking at the eight level uh, was an appropriate cutoff for any drinking, increasing risk at 17, which is close to our 20 cutoff, which we chose, there's another word for it, but it was an ad hoc decision a couple of years ago. And uh, I don't know why she came up short of the 30. Uh, ROC analysis was done with a European paper, and they came up with 30, and she got 17 again, so I don't understand that. But on the nail... She got 8, 37, and 56. And this kind of jibes with what I hear from the field when I get the results back. And uh, this kind of makes sense to me as I put together uh, this experience anecdotally. And so using that same chart, uh, we can look at, you know, less than 8 consistent with abstinence, increasing risk up to 54, whatever it was, and then consistent with excessive drinking after that. Yes, ma'am. With all the things that we do to our nails, mm -hmm. Very good question. When we first started this, and, and this study began back in like 05 or 06, okay, a long time ago. And our first out of the gate experience was that fingernail polish and the stuff, different treatments, did not affect the test. We didn't have any evidence of that. But as we moved into production mode and started looking at these things every day and doing 500 cases a month, um, you know, I'm not a girl, I don't get my fingernails done, but this thing with the gels, uh, I don't know if it's just become popular, if it's always been popular, I don't know. But it, it, we became aware of it, I'll put it to you that way, last year. And the problem that it posed for us is that I don't know if it chemically interfered with the test, but I do know that when you weigh that sample out, most of that weight is that material and not the fingernail. And so instead of testing 20 milligrams a sample, I'm testing 7 or 8 milligrams. So we had to change our collection instructions to remove all cosmetic treatment from the nails. Because some of those, we just, you look at them, you can't really tell. I'll, I'll say it's there, and Jenny will say it's not, and Willie will say it is. And so it's really difficult to look at it and tell. So if they need to go to their manicurist and have it removed, that's just part of the, uh, part of the deal. Um, but we do need to have that material removed as best as it can be removed. So in conclusion, nail testing has been around a long time. You get a little longer window of detection. It's difficult to adulterate. Not impossible, but more difficult. Non-invasive, direct observed collection. 
every time they collect the nails in front of you, I advise you not to clip their nails, but let them clip while you watch. It's a direct observed collection. No color bias, but more studies are needed. And I welcome anybody here that has ideas with the data that we're generating. Frankly, we're generating a treasure trove of data here. And I, I would love to participate with anyone's idea on a research question if you have one. So that's the end of me today.